Hello, everyone. Welcome to Doorway to College. This is the latest in our Educators in Unison series of webinars. And we have a great panel of guests today who are going to talk about creating belonging on campus for all students in times of civil and social unrest. And we are going to wait just a few minutes while everyone comes in to our seminar and give everyone time to find the right space. And I can see we have a lot of people coming in already. As you come in, if you would use your, the chat box that's on your window, on your screen, and let us know where you're from, what school you're from, or what state you're from, that would be great. We also will be using our Q&A box for you to put your questions in. Our panelists have questions of their own, and they will be sharing information, but we would certainly like to get information from all of you, as well as answer any questions that you may have. Um, we are recording this webinar, so just so you know that, and that means that if you know of someone who might want to watch this afterwards, we would be happy to get that out to them, and most of you um, can receive it as well automatically from the Zoom at the end. Um, so again, two ways to communicate in the chat box and in the Q&A, and I will, let's see. We have just 79 people coming in, so I'm going to give it just one more minute before I throw it to Adam Smith, who is our Vice President for College Access and Success for Doorway to College, and he is going to introduce himself and then introduce our panel. So do you want to get started, Adam? Sure. Thank you, Carol. Um, welcome, everybody. As people are coming in, please continue to great to have folks here from all around the country. We know that this is going to be a subject of a lot of interest as many schools have opened and people are preparing for higher ed to open um, as one thing we want to make sure is that people know that this is a safe space. This is an opportunity to discuss challenges as well as things that we're worried about, um, especially with our underrepresented uh, students um, on campuses throughout the country. So please know that this is a safe space and an opportunity for dialogue, that we have some really wonderful people here to discuss with you. Um, my name again, Adam Smith. I'm the Vice President of College Access and Success at Dorita College Foundation. We are a national nonprofit committed to the mission of college access and success for all students. And we do that in various ways by hosting dialogues like this, by training staff to um, navigate things like ACT and SAT prep, um, by also training folks to work in particular in this virtual world with students who most often our trio eligible type students, which is where I started my career. So shout out to our trio colleagues that are on today. Um, I'm going to quickly turn it over to each member of our panel to introduce themselves. So if we can start with um, Christine. Christine, do you want to take yourself off mute, introduce yourself to the crew? Sure. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Christine Fabre rose and I am uh, the Associate Director with the Office of Academic and Retention Support at the University of Akron. I'm originally from Columbia, South America and moved to Miami, Florida and then did uh, undergrad there. My background's in social work and my master's in social work as well. And um, then moved to beautiful, sunny Akron, Ohio eight years ago and I've been working at the university ever since. Um, thank you, Adam, for having me and I look forward to the conversation. Great, thank you, Christine. Uh, Katie, do you want to take your off, yourself off mute? Yes, thank you, Adam. Hello, everyone. My name is Katie Schrader. I'm an assistant director with the Career Development Center at Oberlin College. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Oberlin College is a very small liberal arts institution um, in Northeast Ohio. Uh, I've been working there for a little bit over a year now. I'm from Columbus, so OH, go Bucks. I'm a graduate of Ohio State. Thank you, Dr. Bates. Oh, I appreciate it. Um, and it's a pleasure to see all of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. When they say OH, we say oh no. Isn't that how it works? <laughs> uh, Linda, do you want to take yourself off mute and introduce yourself to the group? Please? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Linda Smith. I serve um, in the role of academic advisor at the University of Tennessee. 
Um, I've been in Tennessee for about three years. My previous background is in um, teaching Dev Ed at a community college, um, serving as an academic coach at Akron. Um, so welcome. Thank you, Dr. Bates. Do you want to introduce yourself to the group, please? Greetings, everyone. Dr. Tierney Bates, uh, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Special Projects and Interim Executive Director for Career Services at the University of North Carolina. Shout out to Christina Gozips. I'm an alum. I'm on alumni board. Katie, my cousin works at Oberlin. Linda, I used to work at UT. And Daniel, I love your Vice President of Student Affairs at Kent State University. We all have those six degrees of separation, right? Um, Daniel, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Daniel Diaz Nelson, he, him, his pronouns. I am the director for the Office of Diversity Outreach and Development at Kent State University. Uh, this is the fifth institution of higher education I've worked at in the country. I've worked also in Georgia, Wisconsin, and New York. I'm originally from Western New York, um, graduate of University of Buffalo, so I have to do it. Horns up. Go, go Bulls. Um, and really excited to be here uh, and talk to you about really a, a very important and necessary conversation. Um, so thanks for, for having me, uh, Adam, and, and I'm glad to be with you all. Thank you. So um, we're going to also give Farrah Sanders, who is our student um, on the panel, super activist, queen, uh, my student, at the University of Alabama, but we're going to give Farah a chance to introduce herself. And Alabama started classes already, right, Farah? We'll be starting on Wednesday. On Wednesday, so students are on campus. So I'd like to throw the first question to Farah. Farah, can you talk about what do you think the likelihood is going to be that there's going to be protests at Alabama this fall? There's going to be some type of student activism and protests around the issues related to social justice, around the issues related to potentially mask wearing and mask mandates, and how do you think um, the campus is preparing for student expression and activism and the potential colliding of different points of view and we also have, if people didn't know, we have a presidential election coming up where we have some other things being stoked. So Farrah, can you talk a little bit about that at Alabama, um, but also introduce yourself and talk about your roles there at UA as well? Absolutely. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Farrah Sanders. I am a senior at the University of Alabama. Um, some of my positions, I've kind of been everywhere on campus, but some of my positions I've been a communications director in SGA, um, vice president of Black Student Union, as well as a DEI student ambassador. And I've also worked within um, Alabama football as a, an assistant of operations and a coach's assistant. So I've been a little bit of everywhere and can give multiple points of view. Um, to Adam's question, honestly, I, I feel like we're facing a very good chance of there being um, increased activism, a student response to things that go on this semester. Um, we've spoken about it. We've seen the idea of it. It's definitely happened over the summer. The lack of in-person education has not stopped students from expressing their voice and um, starting a petition that um, I heard personally from a member of the Board of Trustees got about 3,000 emails in his inbox alone. And that eventually led to the removal of the um, stone that has been sitting in the middle of our quad that was a gift from the Daughters of the Confederacy. Um, the removal of that and the removal of plaques. So there's honestly a lot of activism that I'm expecting personally to see. And I think what makes this a bit different is that we're now seeing a bit more of a bold connection between students, faculty, and staff. And by that, I mean, there's never been a disconnect as in they don't want to work with us. There just may be some level of hesitation on either side. And that could be just um, not really sure how admin may respond, not really sure how your fellow students or your fellow coworkers may respond. And I'm seeing just off of my personal view, a bit less hesitation and a bit more um, action. So we're seeing Safe Return UA, which is mainly ran by faculty and staff where they're publicly calling out on social media the things that just don't quite make sense as far as returning and questions that they have. We've seen the United Campus Workers of Alabama 
who are, you know, asking for hazard pay and have been asking for better working standards in the middle of a pandemic. Those are all really great. Farrah, can you also talk a little bit about, because you and I worked together on some of these issues back when I was at Alabama, the challenges with the naming of the buildings and how students and faculty and staff and even the community are addressing these issues because there's there's we've seen this on other campuses alabama has been a little slower to take the names off some of those buildings but there has been some movement can you talk a little bit about that and how that because the one thing i tried to get people to understand is all of our students pay for those buildings right and so you're paying for a building named after a person who basically, you know, was a grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan and all of these other things. And how can students, right, have belonging if you have buildings who are named after people who said Black folks were subhuman, right? Um, so talk a little bit about some of that movement and what's happening at Bama related to, the, to those issues and how that affects students. Absolutely. And um, just in case anyone thinks that he's being a bit um, exaggerative with the Grand Wizard example, um, Morgan Hall, that is our English building on campus. So it's a very straightforward example that we face every single day. Um, it is a process. It's a really long process and we have seen movement. And even that movement is discussed and um, kind of gone through with a fine tooth comb because largely and historically the movement has been with students, faculty, and staff. It has been started by them. It has been, the research has gone through them, gone by them, um, and the pushing has been by them to administration, to um, even try to persuade SGA, our Student Government Association, to be behind it. And historically, it's been the hardest uphill battle for them because we're always told, and I've been told since my freshman year, and I'm a senior, um, that, you know, oh, well, there's the, the law that we're, that we're facing of preser preservation, excuse me, of historical monuments and preserving our history is, is to usually the scapegoat that they use, which was um, written in conjunction with, uh, with alumni from UA. And um, now as of late, uh, right before the stone was removed and right before um, the renaming of Knott Hall, we were met with um, a bill that was being presented written by an alum of UA that would take away the exemption that universities have to rename these things in order to preserve history, something. Um, you know, my patience is just a bit shortened on that topic. And um, so what essentially happened is a collective, um, you've got to be kidding me. That's really, like all I can explain it as. And you've had students that will flood emails, that have met with board of trustee members, that have flooded social media, and that have um, gotten to the news. Because what we're seeing is that um, one of the largest, one of the most strongest ways to get attention to have UA make a public response is by using the news. And so that's what they've done. They, without a sweat, reached out to, you know, members of AL.com, even our own student media is stepping up and, you know, addressing certain things that um, previously may have gone unaddressed. And so with that, we're seeing this pressure, this outside pressure and this kind of national eye on UA. And that's kind of that big first step in making them do so. And we're happy with the stone being removed. We're happy with um, the fact that they're renaming but we just want to make sure that as this process goes on, uh, we honor the students, faculty, and staff that started and still carry this. Because a lot of what's going on and what we want to make sure doesn't happen is that the same administration that was hesitant, the same student government association that's been historically hesitant, starts patting themselves on the back or starts feeling as though um, there is this giant weight that they've lifted off and the work is done. No, we need to give our roses while it's appropriate. And we also need to understand that this is far from over. Love it. Thank you, Ferris. So one thing that's important, why Alabama is a great case study of this, obviously we know my office at Alabama, I used to be able to see the doors where George Wallace stood, those schoolhouse doors. And I purposely wanted to see them from my office every day so that I could remind myself, yeah, 
there's some roses to give out, but we, we need to ensure all of our students belong in this place and claim this place, whether it's Alabama, it's Kent State, it's Oberlin, it's Tennessee, it's anywhere. Um, Christine, can you talk a little bit about when you hear the word belonging, kind of the theme of this is creating a sense of belonging for all students. What does that mean to you and the students that you serve there at Akron? When you hear belonging, what does that mean to you? Ooh, belonging. Um, they need to make a connection, right? So when you go to, you know, human beings, right? This whole COVID thing has shown that we do need connection, right? So whether it's these panels talking to, I mean, for me, this has been great to connect with you guys, my fellow peers, right? Even though we're on different parts of the world, connecting with other people that are like you and share similar beliefs, but then also connecting with people that you never thought you would have been able to connect with and feel a sense of, oh my gosh, I've been in your shoes before and we have some type of commonality. Um, even though I've never known, I, di I didn't know that I could connect with you, right? So um, I think that's really important, especially for incoming freshmen or even other students that are coming back to campus now or even online and they're not, they're still staying at home. Some type of connection, some type of, I see myself in your shoes or I could see myself in your shoes and I've been there before. Um, and then having similar interests and similar um, ideas and conversations. I think that's really important. Um, so with what I do, I work with STEM students, so students that are in the science, technology, engineering, math, medicine, or um, now with all these brand new programs that we have in our program, different majors, but we just try to make sure that our students are safe in the sense that they can have difficult conversations and um, are able to feel like they matter. Um, and I think that is also very important is um, feeling like you matter and having people that are able to listen to you and are able to make you feel like you matter. Um, okay. Yeah. Then you talk a little bit about belonging and one of your favorite words is intentional, right? How can or how do you or how do you wish UT would be more active in creating a sense of belonging for everyone in an intentional way? Well, I think, you know, some of the stuff that, that I would echo what Christine said as well and, ha you know, feeling welcome in your space. And it's also about feeling safe um, because I think, you know, the institution has the responsibility um, to help students feel safe in the place that they're in. Um, it's just not about, it's also being welcome, of course, and accepted, but you know, am I free to express um, and be who I am, you know, without repercussions? So I think a lot of times, you know, students seek out staff, especially people that they've developed relationships because they do feel, you know, as an academic coach and just, you know, coaching students and all the relationships that I've developed, that you can really tell when a student comes in and they start to really talk to you and, you know, tell you about their experiences there. And, you know, honestly, some of them, you're like, mm, that doesn't really surprise me because as a staff working at a predominantly white institution, you know, you might not always feel in a, in a safe space or whatever to kind of be yourself or to say what you really need to say. So I think, um, I think, now with all the civil unrest and some of the things that have happened, that has happened um, recently, I know that Chancellor Plowman, she is, uh, she offers like office hours. And so she encourages people to come by and to just kind of talk about things that are going on or things that kind of concern them. I think it's about, you know, having that open dialogue with other people on campus so that you, you know, are able to get your concerns out and really start to feel a part of the institution it's you know it's it's going to take some work because it's been a certain way for so long things like this just don't change overnight and again you do have to be intentional we do have to keep talking about the issues you can't talk about them or have a webinar and then you know go back to business as usual so yeah 
Yeah, that's really good. And I think, you know, Farah will tell you and everybody on the panel that knows me, I think it's a challenge that we have to be bold too, though, right? Because that's part of working in higher ed, right? Whether you are, you know, the guy mowing the grass or you're the chancellor, you're a facilitator of learning. And we're teaching students either the right things to do or the wrong things to do, less about what we tell them and more about how we conduct ourselves, right? And Farrah knows, I mean, I was, I was with them, the faculty every day, look, hey, did you think about this? Did you think about that? You know, this is your campus. Nothing better than to have a degree from a place where George Wallace stood in the door and to have a sister like Farrah Sanders claim Roll Tide, right? Nothing better than to have our LGBT students claim and Roll Tide, right? That's some good trouble right there. Right, that's that John Lewis, I'm gonna have myself some good trouble and I'm gonna be trans and I'm gonna walk in graduation and own it just like everybody else. But that's where we come in because they're young people. We need to stand and say, we got your back. You're gonna, you know what, I can get another job. You can't get another life, right? Tierney talked about all the places he's been. I tell you what, we can get another job. This is their life and they're learning from us how to be professionals and how to be in the workplace and how to make some good trouble, right? And my mentors have always told me, Adam, nobody's lynching you today. So you know what? If all you risk is people saying, oh, we don't want you to be here, we don't want you to work here, then that's nothing compared to what John Lewis risked standing on that bridge, right? Just so I could say to Farah, we're going to get in some good trouble today and Kearney, talk a little bit about how the needs of our Black students, but even our Latinx students and our LGBT students, how their needs differ and are the same than the professionals in the space. Because when we say Black Lives Matter, it isn't just George Floyd up the street from where I grew up. His life matters, but also your life matters sitting in your office at the University of North Carolina. You know, the football players' lives at Alabama matter, even though they want to go out on the field, your life matters, right? So how do these things differ and how does this play out in the area of COVID and how are they different, the lives of faculty and staff and how they need to be supported in this space and in this time compared to students? Well, I'll start, Adam, uh, with students. For students, uh, I think of it as this. When it comes to diversity, it's being invited to the party. Inclusion is being invited uh, to dance, belonging is dancing like, woo, nobody is watching. So I'm here. Everything is exciting. Everything is going on because this place is built for me. It's like a house. When you build a house, it's one thing to invite everybody in, but how do you make sure you do the HGTV style that the house is reflective of everybody that's in the house? So it's important for students on the flip side to be able to use their voice like fairer and other students as far as that is concerned. Most PWIs do the wrong thing. And I say this because I've worked at plenty of them. Uh, where we go out and do this recruitment number of trying to get all black, brown, uh, LGBTQ students to come to our institutions. But from a cultural standpoint, our institutions are not ready for that. And so we have to own that. So we have to say that to our students, like we apologize here at UNC. We have to apologize that we have past history that we know that we didn't want you at one point in time. And we're trying to make up for that. It's going to take time. But you said it earlier. How are we going to be bold in higher education? Well, we see a lot of times, like you said, people get jobs left and right. If you're talented, people will bring you aboard. Is Where's the bold leadership to make sure that that campus truly changes for those black and brown students? Demographics show us the future of higher ed is black and brown. And so if an institution is not planning and engaging, talking to students, whether that's in focus groups, looking at when you talk to parents, and telling them the truth as well and helping them navigate that because we still have a lot of first generation students and parents as i like to call them first generation parents who are trying to understand why they're sending their daughter and son to unc because of course it's a great name top 25 school but they realize that there's certain things they've been taught especially in a black and brown household that they're going to have to navigate on the flip side staff it's about microaggressions it's about being the only one if you're the faculty member or one of very few in your department and so how are your voices heard? So you have to create a true inclusive workplace model that from the chancellor down to uh, the guy that's taking out the trash understands and gets. I tell people, 
how you treat staff is a reflection of how you are as a leader. So if you see the chancellor walk in and you're like, oh, hey, chancellor, hey, Dr. Miller, all the other great stuff, you should be the same way to Les who comes in and takes out the trash for you. Why? Because he's part of the fabric. So Les might not make the $600,000 that a Dr. Miller makes, but Les still has his ear to ground on what's going on. Most faculty and staff, specifically black and brown, play an extra tax at PWIs because they have to not only write, publish, do all that great things that, that they say they need to get that tenure, but they also have to mentor other black and brown individuals as well, where my white colleagues don't. I always say this when I go into our space in our meeting, I say, hey, when I walk across campus, I gotta interact with all students. So my white colleagues always say, you can walk across campus and not once interact with a black and brown student. Automatically, black and brown students are gonna to navigate to me. Automatically, my white students are gonna to navigate to me because of my role and title and what I do. And so that's something that we have to kind of understand and we need to be able to create uh, ERG groups or uh, commissions, whatever like that, where the voices are truly heard and have some true power. And when I say power, when we offer true things, because I, I laugh, what happened with George Floyd and the things we're seeing in higher education happened with Mike Brown, happened with, uh, what's my call it, uh, and had been Baton Rouge, uh, Alton Sterling. All this has been happening for years. All of a sudden people just saw what? It lied. Right, so what the TV was to uh, John Lewis is what social media is to this generation. The difference between this generation is they're not going for it. The Pharaohs, the Generation Z is like, look, we're gonna hold your feet to the fire. So we need to be as a staff supportive of them, vice versa, we need to come together, uh, our students and our staff, uh, and have a dialogue with the campus leadership and not just the chancellor, I'm talking about the board. Because what our boards look like and make up usually Sorry to say, it's usually older white men who are still kind of saying like, hey, uh, what's going on? Or want to put a Band-Aid over a situation. As you talk about with buildings names and stuff like that, that's great. You can change all the names on the buildings you want, but the culture can still be crappy. And so that's important for us to understand is how do we shift true culture that our students feel like they belong, that our staff, you know, make sure their voices are heard. We always hear these plans of, we're gonna create this staff and we're gonna create this leadership program and we're gonna recruit more black staff. I said, show me the metrics. We've been in higher ed too long for us not to move the needle. And you can't tell me you can't find black and brown talent. There is more black and brown talent ever with masters and PhDs ever in history right now. And I can put some good people in your space because I know them. Well, and that's what, it, it, that's interesting, uh, Tierney, that you said that because well, they said that to me at Tennessee one time. I, I'm Plus, sure they did. They said they and they and, and they said that and they say that all the time. We can't. We would hire them, but they don't. They don't apply with us. It's interesting that they always apply to work for me, right? I mean, my staff. And it's it's one of the things that I find interesting is that this obsession with right face in the right place, or right face in the only place, right? So we can work in trio. Uh, there can be one or two advisors. We sure can work in multicultural, but the, we can't work in areas that we're not supposed to be in. So it's, it's breaking those areas open, right? And um, redefining, I mean, my staff when I was at Alabama was mostly people of color. We weren't the advising center for students of color. We were just the advising center. And I promise you this, when the playing field is level, brown women, are gonna win, right? I mean, if it's fair, I mean, the sisters are gonna get, they're, they're gonna run all of us, right? Um, so that's what happens when you make it fair. My staff at Akron, we didn't serve, we weren't a minority program. We served everybody with people that were mostly brown, right, and LGBT. Um, so when you make the playing field truly level, that's how you know, right? If it's level, it really happens. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask um, Katie, Katie, can you talk a little bit about your work in becoming a better ally? And because I've been doing a lot of pushing for my white brothers and sisters to be less allies and more accomplices. I need you to ride shotgun in the car with right? I don't need you just to stand there and have my back. I need you to be in the car, right? So talk a little bit about um, how you are working to become a better ally, 
work to become a better accomplice? And then what do you think are some of the benefits to you personally of interrupting microaggressions, racism, all of those kind of things that can happen against our students? Absolutely. So, so I think where it kind of, where it comes down to is just level of comfortability. Like you got to be uncomfortable. If I'm, if I'm comfortable, I'm not doing it right. <laughs> so, so I'm constantly having to push myself into places where, where I am uncomfortable having to step out and be in a space where I don't know if it's the best thing to say in the moment, but I know for me that it's right and it, it's what is true. Um, I have to be open to learning. Um, so that's one of the best things I have to say about Oberlin is that we have a, we have a huge history of, of students um, going out and protesting for what is good and what is great and, and being humble to that and taking that in and allowing students and staff to, to educate you and to inform you. Um, I, I know my lens is a, a young professional, a white woman, and, and that is not a universal lens. And so just accepting that there are other individuals out there and other experiences and, and being open to feedback from others is, is where I've, I've definitely learned the most. Um, I think, I think that I think for my white colleagues, I think that I, I try to just in my role kind of demonstrate some of the actions that maybe they should be taking to have students get on board with them. And so, so that is through action. I think a lot of us, we like to have our webinars, we like to sit around, we like to have these conversations about what we can do and be better. But when we're out there with the students, when they're out, we're out there with our peers and our, our coworkers, we're not doing those things. So, so kind of being uncomfortable in that moment has, has done me, I like to say that's done me pretty well. Um, I, I work at Akron, which is a prominent, uh, prominent white institution. So, so I have to, as a white woman, I have to continuously put myself out there and have students see through my actions that I care for them. I want to be there for them. And I'm not just there for other individuals that are white. So, so I have um, an example of that is I had a student in my class. He was uh, one of my Brown students. He, he was very quiet, very covert in class and he he didn't say anything and i he just he passed he did a great job he met all of his marks and so for for all that i could have known you know he would have finished that whole class and we really wouldn't have had too much of a conversation he didn't really disrupt anything he wasn't you know overly exceptional he was just he was there he passed the class he did a great job and and i had i had reached out to him though because he was so quiet and so i took that moment to be like hey i know we finished this class and we didn't really get to have a relationship i just wanted to check in with you and he did not respond to me. So I was like, okay. So in that moment, instead of taking it on the student of like, oh, maybe that's on the student, the student doesn't wanna respond. No, that's on me. I didn't do a good job as a professor in that moment. I didn't teach my student well enough. So I reached back out to the student, didn't get another response and was like, all right, I really fudged up here. <laughs> so I happened to be eating in a, in a facility and, and I was, going to put my tray down and my student, he saw me, he saw, I saw him and I was like, we're done. So I was actually meeting with my peers. And in that moment I said, you know, Hey, I'd love to sit with y'all. I'd love to chat. I'd love to joke around, but like, this is what's important to me right now. So through that demonstrate action of just going and sitting with the student and him at first being like, I don't, I don't want to be in trouble. And it was like, I just want to see how you're doing today. I just want to hang out. How's life? Um, that student, he and I, we now have weekly conversations where he just wants to check in with me and, and have me be, you know, his accountability person as he goes through his education because he is a, a he comes from a low income family. He is a first generation student and he has no idea. And, and so now know that he has an ally there. He has an advocate. And what, what was the term you're using? Adam accomplice uh, there with him. I, it just, it makes all the difference. So for individuals who, who are, who are white, who are white presenting. I think it's definitely, it, you have to be uncomfortable. You have to, you have to say, uh, you have to put it out there. I think a lot of times being silent is, is what definitely will bite you as well um, by not saying anything. So I've, I've been in meetings too, where I've told students, you know, hey, here's my situation. Here's kind of what, how I think we should move forward. I also do recognize that you're a young black male. So we need to address that. And that might be very different from my experience. So here's the kind of advice that I would like. I think that we, the direction that we, we might wanna go with this conversation. So, so speaking out, speaking truth, being humble when individuals are, are kind of correcting you and updating you, learning, taking time to learn and not asking for other people to learn, but actually taking the action to learn from yourself um, and being uncomfortable. I hope I answered the question. I kind of went on off there.
Wait, you're on mute, Adam. Adam. Oh, sorry. All the talk about, you know, when John Lewis passed, you know, you have these giants and legends passing away. And we think that Katie's, the best word you said was uncomfortable, right? Um, we think that all of this action, right? I mean, right now people are questioning Kamala Harris and is she black? Like black is some golden ticket. I mean, uh, nobody handed out freedom. People forget that the Montgomery bus boycott was 380 plus days of people struggling just to sit where you want on the stinking bus. Here in Knoxville, they've painted over the Black Lives Matter mural three times. We got plenty of paint. You're dealing with the wrong group of people, okay? We didn't ride buses, okay? We faced machine, and Emmett Till is like our history. So at some point, as my wife talks about, this is about righteousness, right? And all of the accomplices joining with us in some of these struggles, but we also have to question ourselves on a lot of these things. When I went to Alabama, Alabama was a big questioner for me because you think Alabama and one of the groups of students that I worked with that, that my center advised were conditional admits. Well, you think conditional admit Alabama, you think Black Belt, you think Selma, oh no. Our, most of the African-American students at Alabama were like Farah, Huxtables, right? They're coming from those Huxtable families. And their parents are in the NBA or their parents are Hollywood stars. Well, my mindset was complete. I heard conditional admit and I thought my trio life, first gen, low income. No, these were out-of-state kids that were largely white, that weren't getting a Pell Grant, that were just writing a check, mom and daddy, to go to Alabama so they could be in a sorority right? That's very different from what I thought. So I think we also have to be the first ones in higher ed. And, and Daniel, you're, you're going to get the next one being at Kent State, because I think this is a time of reckoning for us to challenge what we've seen as history that is really passed off as mythology, right? All of these myths that has been in American history, it's time to let the real scholars tell us what the true history is, and let's deal with it and let's grow together and move forward. Um, for everybody who's watching and listening, I don't want it to be all my questions. So as you guys are thinking of questions for the panel, please put them in the Q&A. We've got questions, but your questions are much better than mine. Daniel, being at Kent State, home of May 4th, right? Talk a little bit about how we go from statements, right? Everybody's put out their Black Lives Matter statement, all of this stuff. And you were just listening to your student body president talk about protests and the work they're going to do going into the fall semester. How do we go from that to real structural change on your campus, right? What are some of the things that you're seeing? What are you pouring into students? Um, how does that happen, especially in a world that's more virtual than ever? I always love being a part of these because, you know, we there's some heat in this. So y'all, Dr. Bates, Rose, Katie, I know you live it and, 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 and breathe it. It's, it's just who you are. So I appreciate that. Um, so May 4th, 1970, 50 years ago, um, uh, uh, Kent State is infamously known for the, the shooting and, and murder of four students, injuring nine um, uh, by our very own government, by our very own soldiers. Um, one thing, though, that we don't often talk about is Jackson State University, a historically black college university, that uh, a few, uh, I think it was 10 days later, I can't remember, the, um, um, right now I just don't remember the date, but two students also died, uh, uh, Gibbs and Green, uh, and actually if you go to Jackson State, it's the Gibbs Green uh, Promenade or the Green Greener Way thing there, so anyway. Uh, we're, we're, we're historically known, and we're also not too far from when Tamir Rice was murdered, right? Um, you know, uh, we're, so um, Kent State, Ohio, Midwest, like we're not immune, and we're, we're definitely unfortunately known in many ways uh, for this. And so I think one of the things, and I'm glad you brought up uh, Brother Lewis, so my own way of, 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 you know, I have to wear this to come get out of this room, it's my office, um, so there's times I wear that, there's times I represent me, I'm, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican, you know, so there's opportunities to be able to do that. But to your question, though, as far as how do we take it from statements and that we love black people, 
Black Lives Matter, you know, um, we're down, we're gonna fight against systematic racism. Um, I, I think one of the things that um, uh, ha has to happen, and it goes beyond the buildings that Dr. Bates says, you can keep changing all the names of the buildings. Um, I mentioned earlier, I'm an, my alma mater is University of Buffalo. Um, we started changing, uh, they just got announced that we're changing uh, buildings on campus. Miller Fillmore, who was uh, also president, you know, um, James Putnam, very racist um, person that was part of our institution. So it goes beyond the, just renaming things, although that is a, definitely something to do. Um, I think it's still important. Farah mentioned about at, at, at uh, uh, Alabama. Um, I think what the other, the, the systematic thing is, um, and I'll go right down to the, to, is, is where's the money? Where are we spending our money? Who are we paying? We talked about black talent, oh, Dr. Bates, you talked about black talent, brown talent everywhere. I mean, how many Latinos and Latinas that have advanced degrees, um, get doctorates in process of, I'm one of those in process of, you know, soon to be Dr. Smith again, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll catch up to all the women in our, that we know that are running things. Um, you know, one is my wife who actually, I'm trying to catch her with the doctorate stuff. Um, but I think the money is really where it is. Um, are we paying people to do the same thing, women and men? Are we paying black women and men the same as our, their white counterparts to teach the same classes, to publish the same amount, if not more, articles, research, adding to scholarly work that we all are learning and or relearning for some of us. Um, so I think there's, there's that place there. Um, one thing that I know, and I work in a diversity office, I'm the director of you know, diversity office, outreach and I work with K-12 institute, you know, work pipeline, really trying to have future educators and people being in fields that are historically white, that um, are historically women, you know, it's really looking at that. and. Well, uh, one of the things that uh, we've been, I, I've been looking at, even within my own office, is how are we providing services to people in a way that is exclusionary, right? How are we excluding people from the things that we have? And I'll give you one example that actually COVID has helped, and I'm glad we uh, it has. Is oftentimes we would do um, what we call linked up. It's it's like uh, it, we link people up with mentors um, and supports because. As I've said before, and many times I always like to say, reach back and pull up, right? All of us are successful because somebody reached back and said, no, you coming. Well, I, I'm not smart enough. No, you coming. I'm not this enough. No, you coming because we need more and you're going to be, or even if you're the first, I'm going to bring you through, right? Um, so this reach back and pull up, we have this link up program where if you were on campus on Wednesday nights at 530 in this room, you could be part of it. And that we would bring speakers, we would bring alums, we'd spend money, we'd get ready to go to conferences, et cetera. But if you couldn't go to that space in that time because of your, whatever life was happening, you didn't have access. So by having remote opportunities, we are now actually be able to provide those resources simultaneously. We call it synchronous now, right? We've been hearing that a lot, right? Synchronously. Um, we were, so we're looking at that. And because before that, we were excluding people who might have had jobs or had to go home to their kids. Right, and we know disproportionately people in college that are black and brown are not able to just go to school and be a college student. Very rarely, regardless if you're from the Huxtables, Adam, um, or not. <laughs> um, you know, there's other priorities, and also it's just harder to sometimes be experience uh, college. Um, so, from from statements, it's where that where that money is. Uh, the other is what are we doing to that um, is excluding um, instead of, you know, excluding people from the table, how are we making that table bigger? Um, you know, Katie talked about that, like, no, Hey, you know, as, as the example of the young man that she was referring to, like, no, like my, my experience and my vision is only can see this. And so I need to be able to see yours too. So what is that? That's the accomplice. That's the allyship. Right, that's the advocate. It, it, you know, I think advocate and accomplice. That's kind of the similar where there's the action that tied to. I'm down with Brown. I'm down with my brothers and sisters, but I'm actually going to be out there in front doing it too, right? And not doing it just so you can say, "Hey, I have a black friend," or "Hey, I helped some. I did a march today." Um, it's you know, calling out people um, 
uh, you know, we're, lo we're looking at, and I'll give one example and I'll be quiet, but we're looking at, for example, pass fail right now, both with COVID, this pa that pandemic and our racism pandemic that we're experiencing. We're looking at, and we know that students are, if, had pass fail right in April, May, right? This when we talked about a lot, how did that impact grad school, how to impact law school, how to impact just life. But we're looking at, well, for some courses, especially some of our liberal arts that aren't tied necessarily to the content expert that you want to be, why can't we have pass fail? Right? Because if you have a, a, a D, you can actually say you passed that course versus an A. So why not get to a, a certain, why not change that? Because we're creating these, especially now in this remote fashion, we know black and brown people in, in, in communities don't have access to computers. People, college students are still using their cell phone to do papers and do labs and prepare for the SAT or whatever test that is said that I have to do in order to get into your school, right? So I think there's some definitely things when we look at statements to money to policy of changing the behavior um, and that that I think is where we could look at advocacy and I also think too again in your own way how can you remind gently remind and then uh, I'm going to you know sometimes have to forcefully remind you because that's not how we do things um, uh, so yeah can I comment okay. as well? yeah go ahead please Christine so talking about how you forcefully remind people right so as a very white passing Colombian woman that I am, Christine Rose sounds like the whitest name, right? I always introduce myself and I say that I'm Colombian because you never know who's behind, you know, the screen or whatever rooms we're in, right? So that's definitely something important, especially now with, you know, being online. And I was talking with my fellow colleague, we're both the advisors for the Pride and STEM group. And in my office, I have, you know, the pride flag and, you know, trans flags and all these things. But now that if I'm working at home, this is like the plainest room to be in. How am I showing that I'm an ally? How am I showing my students or my peers that I'm an ally and I'm supporting, you know? So that's a big thing now with our students. We have to be able to, and I love Nielsen that you have, you know, the, the mask and things like that, that's so important, but we definitely have to be able to be more vocal about the things that we do so that people know that we support, right? Um, so that's that's really a challenge that we've had with our online meetings with our students and meet, you know doing orientations and things like that. How do you make sure that your students know that you're supporting and that you're an ally? And another thing that I want to talk about too is when I'm I'm in a diversity committee now at Akron, and it's so difficult for some of our colleagues to say the word black and brown or to say LGBTQ, and I'm like. You mean instead of saying minority students, can we just say the word black? Can we just say brown? Can we just say Latino, Latina? Like, why is it so difficult to say that word? If you cannot say that word, then people get murdered. Like, that is why people die, is because you cannot get uncomfortable and say the word black or brown. Um, so that's the other thing about being uncomfortable. Like, yes, I have to get out of my little safe zone in my beautiful office where I see black and brown all day, but I'm going to another, you know, a meeting across campus and it's all these white people and they're scared to say the word black. So I have to say the word black. I have to say brown. I have to say Latino, Latina, whatever. Um, so it's definitely getting uncomfortable. So I appreciate Katie, you saying that. Um, and yeah, that was it. <laughs> I had to say something. Tierney, Tierney, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to echo off of what Daniel uh, and Christina just said is that language is important on a college campus. So three things we need to do on our universities or any organization or even the corporate space, define diversity. She just said it. You know, it, we try to lump everything into diversity and guess what? It gets watered down and nothing gets accomplished. Define what you're doing for black. Define what you're doing for the Latinx community. Define what you're doing around LGBTQ, Asian Pacific Islander. Define what diversity is for your institution. Define inclusion. What does that look like at an organization or at higher ed? Define equity, right? As Daniel mentioned, it's about the money. Every institution should take 1% of their overall budget and invest it in DEI and B initiatives across the board. That is true commitment. Also, on top of that, you're able to give your chief diversity officer, I still got issues with Akron's, um, opportunity to go ahead and give you some ability to really make some change, right? Every school should create a DEI dashboard or 
scorecard where they can hold themselves accountable for the next three years. I don't need to take five year strategic plans or sit down on a DEI committee to tell you what we need to do that we can do tomorrow and put it into play. You just have to get the right people on the bus, give them the autonomy to make that happen and do it. But language is key, like she just said, we need to define those things, but we need to do it by our offices and it needs to work all the way up to the chancellor and president's office as well. That is how you get true unique buy-in within an organization. If you take um, Daniel's office and they start saying, well, we're gonna define what DEIB looks like and what those terms mean in our office. And then you go over to um, career services and they do the same thing as far as that is concerned. And then it goes up and bubbles up to the VPs and to the president and to the board of trustees to truly then look at how do we implement this infrastructural uh, institutional racism and get rid of it by actually having the involvement of all campuses, right? So that's very important, that language and give me a 1% of that budget, baby. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with all of that. I think one of the things is and people have said this through this whole struggle, right? That the carrying the water of equity cannot be the responsibility of black and brown folk, right? But black and brown folk need to hold people accountable, right? If you are going to claim me as your black friend or your black family member, your black son, right? Or your black husband, you are going to do work on yourself. It's almost like my dad, the alcoholic, right? I had bottom lines with him. I can't get you clean, bro. But you know what? I'm not going to be your son in the same way unless you do your work and you start working on yourself. Katie's in my life because Katie does her work. Otherwise, she wouldn't be in my life because you can't claim me like that. And that's where our responsibility comes in. Linda, can you talk a little bit about the work you do in action to support your colleagues, especially in the area, you know, your colleagues of culture, creating a campus, you know, that hires diverse people. Talk a bit, a little bit about how you support others in the space, especially at a PWI like Tennessee. Well, I think it's just about, uh, for me, it's, um, again, it's having a connection with those people um, that I work with on campus. You know, you mentioned something about um, people actually, you know, being in your life. I have a, a few colleagues in, in particular, um, uh, she, you know, she's white. And after all this civil unrest and all this stuff happened, I, I, it was a long time. I, I hadn't heard anything. And so when she finally reached out, it was a text and it said, how are you? And so it took me a while to think about how I just responded to that. Um, I did respond back and I said, well, um, not doing too well. A lot of things going on right now. I'm surprised I hadn't heard from you sooner. And I just kind of was honest with her and I said, we're going to have to rethink our friendship moving forward and what that really looks like. Um, so I think for me, it was just really about being honest, um, honest with my feelings, honest with what I've seen go on in campus from uh, search committees. You know, we talk a little bit about search committee. Well, who was on that search committee? Well, this person, that person. I'm like, well, what about this person from that area? Oh, I didn't think about it like that. So people sometimes really, I know it's, it, it, it's not, it doesn't seem to be intentional, but it needs to be intentional. Does that make sense? It, it, it's not intentional by, by them because they think about the people being on search committee that like are in their spaces, the people that they know. Oh, well, we'll think about this, but she knows me, but I don't know. It's for me, I think it's just about really being honest with my colleagues, um, being there to support my colleagues, um, being there to talk to them, I remember, um, I, actually, Tierney, uh, I work in the Center for Career Development. Our, our positions got moved to the Center for Career Development, and we had a, a big meeting one day, and nothing was mentioned. It was just like business as usual. It was driving me just a little bit crazy. So I just kind of reached out to the director afterwards and, you know, sent her a message and say, hey, can, can you call me? 
And, you know, we had a really good conversation. And again, this was me being honest with her, like, hey, I was really surprised no one brought that information up. There's a lot of things going on now. Um, your black and brown um, colleagues in your office, hey, I mean, this stuff is really hard. And so I think it's just about being honest with the people that you work with and, you know, not accepting anything less than, you know, if you're not going to be uh, an accomplice or you're not going to be an ally for me, then you're in my life. Why? I mean, this stuff is really, it just, it really matters. And I think it, you do have to be intentional. You do have to be selective with the people in your life. So, um, yeah, that's that's pretty much what it means to me is just kind of being honest and just putting things out there in the open. Because if we're not having a dialogue about it, then then I don't think anything's really going to change. That's right. Yeah, and I think one of the interesting things that I put out one day shortly after George Floyd passed was how many people of color, and I put out this survey, Twitter or something like that, how many people of color name for me the number of white people that you're truly honest with? And now it was really interesting generationally, right? So old people like me, it was like one, right, was the average. People Farah's age, there were more, right, that you're honest with. But there's this guardedness. I always think of this is the Lion King and we're the meerkat, we're Timon and Pumbaa, and we're just trying to navigate, right? And if I'm honest, the lion might, he might remember he's a lion and might come get me. So I think that's what we owe, is that honesty with our friends, like Linda's talking about and saying, look, this isn't cool. And I'm just gonna tell you, you can't claim my friendship if you aren't claiming my struggle. You need to get in this car with me. And if you aren't gonna get in the car with me, cool, that's all right, um, but you're not gonna claim that you're with me. Farrah, can you, I'm going to kind of let you finish this up. Can you talk a little bit about your concerns, right? You have the whole MAGA world, right? Because this isn't a time where people, people have always told me, well, Adam, you know, this is politics. Well, George Wallace ran for office. He was a political leader. Bull Connor was elected too, right? Um, in the same state that you're in right now. So talk a little bit about your fears about the whole MAGA world descending in Tuscaloosa, right? Students who have those ideologies that are, at one point people will look back on and think this was not righteous. Forget that they were elected, right? So you're gonna have that world. You're also gonna have the BLM and all the allies show up and how that, your fears about those things connecting on campus and your fears that one voice will be amplified over another, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, and also, Dr. Bates, I saw your comments. I uh, regularly meet with Dr. Pope um, so far. I think he's a really great guy. And um, we're just trying to get him to know the campus. So I will tell him that I was on a panel with you. Um, I believe that my concerns are Honestly, my concerns are deeply intertwined with coronavirus and the pandemic because it changes. As I was speaking with someone from Safe Return UA, um, it shifts how activism looks to us traditionally because um, we're used to physically coming together, making a physical showing of solidarity, making coming together, physically meeting in one room, creating a letter, sending it out to publications, sending it to administration. And as of right now, that's something that's just not safe. It's something that even if um, you're a trusted leader, it's just not a safe decision to gather all of us in one room and figure that out. So a concern is just how do we transition and safely use socially distant measures to continue our message? Um, how do we ensure because um, in an air of honesty, we've already seen ways that the coronavirus has been used to manipulate and has been used to kind of shade over things. So how do we also hold people to a standard and say, no, 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 you can't use this pandemic that is affecting our lives in a very real way to kind of skate past certain things or to cover up certain things or to fill positions that should be open to everyone. Um, it's, it's, very, it's a very interesting thing that we're navigating. And um, as, 
as I'm also concerned for our, our safety publicly, um, and as we always have been, um, the culture of Make America Great Again is and has been a very dangerous culture for people of color at UA. And that was made evident when Donald Trump decided to visit for our Alabama and LSU game. It involved a series of meetings. It involved a lot of prep, very, 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 very close to the deadline. And it was something that um, we couldn't necessarily say no to. He was just coming. And so all we can do is prepare. And what that did for us was show that this isn't necessarily, oh, it's just you don't agree. No, these are people that we have to sequester ourselves into our own area, which is the predominantly black part of the campus where we tailgate, which is by the Ferguson Center. We have to put ourselves over there. And we have to stay there. It's not safe for us to leave that area. However, while we're in that area, we also have to have plainclothes officers. We also have to have plainclothes security because we're well aware of even if we just mind our business, it's still not safe. Um, Mother Emanuel Church. We have these historic examples of it's just not safe for us in any capacity. So while we're afraid, we have to figure out how to still step forward. While we're in our space, we have to figure out how to push that space along as a force. And it's something that is continuously talked about, but it's also something that faces scrutiny from, you know, our own administration, our own student body, our own student government association. There's just so many different levels that we have to pass through of people who ideally are our allies, but in situations they've shown that they're not, or they've shown that they would rather be, quote, moderate. When you don't get very many black and white situations in our existence you get there's a lot of gray areas this is very cut and dry you are either for us or you're not and there's not a very there's not a fence you can walk or you cannot walk that fence for very long and so i think eventually we're going to see the people that have been possibly lining the fence they're going to be shown and what are we going to do once we've made up our mind okay, you have decided by not actively being with us, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. You have chosen the side of indifference. You've chosen the side of continuing the system that makes it hard for us. Um, that's probably like a couple of a thousand concerns that we have, but it's, it's very real and it's something that we're addressing in real time as we are coming back, you know, within a week, in a week. Yeah. And it's, and it's, you know, I'm just gonna let Farrah finish it. It's really important that we, who all work in the space, understand that our students, we get paid to be in the space, our students pay to be in the space. They deserve to feel safe in the, pay, in the place that they pay to be in, that is their home, they pay rent, it is their space. And they need us to support them. And they need to know, Farrah Sanders knows I got it. No matter what happens, you need to know, they need to know that we love them, we see them, we support them. And you know what? We, we got their back. And there's, a, there's very few times in life that there's a defining moment. The question for my grandkids are going to ask me one day, Papa, what side did you stand on? What'd you say? What did you risk? See, John Lewis, he went out strong. That brother risked a lot. Um, this is just work for us. And when Farrah summarizes it, that you're on campus, your campus that you pay to attend, and you don't feel safe being there, like physically safe, that's a challenge. That's a challenge. Carol, can you close us out, please? Absolutely. Thank you all so much for your time. I appreciate the heat of this conversation and the honesty. And I hope that uh, Doorway to College can be a conduit to as many people seeing this as possible because it was a lot of really important information and um, really impactful discussion. So I really appreciate your time and I know you all are very, very busy people. So we appreciate that. 
Um, if the um, attendees are interested in more of these conversations, our next panel is September 17th. It is going to be a panel of current students and they are going to talk about what they would have liked, what they wish they would have known when they were in high school that maybe would have made their college experience different or the transition better. So we are going to talk about that on September 17th and you can go to our website doorway to college um, dot com to sign up for that forum. So thank you all very, very much. Y'all be safe out there. Everybody be good. That's right. Stay strong at King State, baby. Hey. Go Zips. <laughs>